For the past month or so, I've been playing Oblivion for the first time, maybe a bit too much, but that's besides the point. Like most people, the only other Elder Scrolls game I've played prior is Skyrim, and I put a couple hundred hours into it, you know, beat the main quest, finished both DLCs, ran my horse up a mountain, all that stuff, right? And so, with experience in both games, I figure I'd compare them listing off what, in my opinion, are the pros and cons of each, because I assume a lot of people are like me, and I've only ever played Skyrim and never played Oblivion. So this video operates under the assumption that you've played Skyrim but haven't played Oblivion, or that you've played both, or maybe you haven't played either, and in that case, go play The Witcher 3, it's better than both. The biggest thing I dislike about both games is the way you level up skills. There's three methods, which are books, trainers, and using it in combat. And in paper, this sounds fine, except the fact that some of them are so goddamn slow and don't keep up with your level. And let's face it, skill books are not a viable way to level up. So in actuality, there's two ways to level up. It feels like your skills never actually keep up with you or they're where you want them. Plus the world scales to you. So just because I'm level 20, a bunch of Daedra spawning, even though my damage skills are at level 40, which in oblivion leads to you having to make some cheap spell in your desired school and and then just running into a wall and auto casting it or in skyrim since you can't make spells jumping up and down in a forge to increase your destruction and then healing to increase your restoration or you just sit there making iron daggers over and over again because otherwise if you only ever smith when you need to your smithing is never gonna fucking increase the developers assume that just because you use certain skills a lot they should make the amount of experience you get for doing them really fucking small which if you think about it for two seconds, makes sense. But if you think about it for three seconds, it doesn't make any sense because in both games, leveling up your armor, lock picking, sneak, block, your armor or your smithing in Skyrim, alchemy and speech the old fashioned way is so fucking tedious. It's not like those last few skills are worth all this time and effort either. Having all the perks and lock picking and speech are at most small quality of life improvements that you'll never even notice. Thankfully the math for this already exists so let me break it down for you. Alright, so in Oblivion, every time you get hit, your heavy armor goes up 1.25 experience points, and your light armor goes up 1.5. Which means that even if they're both major skills, which if you haven't played Oblivion, just means that they level up faster, that to get to heavy armor 100, you need to get hit 4,905 times, or for your light armor, 4,088 times. And in Skyrim, it's based on how much damage you take. So if you take like 70 points of damage, you get 70 experience points. And for both of them, it's the same. So to get your armor to level 100 in Skyrim means you need to take just a measly 528,804.0234 points of damage. I'll put all the really annoying ones on screen now so you can read them because it'll be really fucking tedious if I just individually go through all of them and all their different variables. This isn't a fucking school presentation. I'm not gonna sit here and recite a piece of paper. The way I wrote it out works is there's the amount of XP you get for doing the thing once and then the number on the left is how many times it takes for you to get to 100 in the worst case scenario and the number on the right is the best case scenario. But to drive my point into the ground, the way you level up skills takes way too fucking long. Then there's the combat, which feels fine, and there's room for experimentation with all the different weapons and stuff, but I'd be lying if I said in both games it doesn't amount to more than just spamming left click and sometimes right click to block or cast a spell. It doesn't help either that in both games the animations are super floaty and it doesn't feel like there's any weight or impact to your swings, and the third person is completely useless in combat. Here are the Grisword animations in Oblivion, here are the animations in Skyrim, and here's the animations in Dark Souls, a game that also came out when Skyrim did. Elder Scrolls, like Pokemon, has always been a series that just felt like a bit like a couple years behind in technology. Like somehow in the five years between Oblivion and Skyrim, they didn't fix a third person camera and all the children have the same face despite the game releasing in 2011. Here are some other games that came out in 2011. Although I will say, the combat in Oblivion and Skyrim is still leagues better than Morrowind though, where weapons are more of like a suggestion than tangible objects. In Morrowind, you weren't attacking to do damage, you were attacking for the idea of doing damage. And I hate that you never know where an enemy is coming from in Oblivion, it's so fucking anxiety inducing, I swear. Sometimes the game doesn't just mess with you. You just be casually going about your day, minding your business, then the music starts playing. Then you look around and you can't find anything, and you're like, all right, well, I'm sure my summoned AI will go get it, right? 
but then your summon just sits there. And then you're like, fuck this, I'll cast a Detect Life spell, I'm sure that'll get it, right? But you still can't find anything, and it's like, alright, fuck this, I'm just gonna go use Free Camp. And turns out, it was a fucking mud crab that aggroed you 30 miles down the road that's slowly waddling towards your level 61 character. Here's a tip from me to you if you also struggle with this. If you're stuck in combat, no matter how far away you go, just save and reload. That, that usually fixes it. Oblivion also had much more diversity in the magic, which I'll get much more in depth in later, but part of what came with that is that you couldn't just rely on one set play side. Enemies also had much more magic, so you couldn't just be a pure warrior because what if an enemy disintegrates your weapons or ability? Now you don't have a fucking greatsword anymore. Or what if they have an enchantment on their armor that reflects physical damage? Now you can't do damage to them without taking damage yourself. And you can't be a pure mage because what if an enemy silences you? Now you can't cast spells. Or what if they have resistance to magic or they absorb spells? And this is why the best class to play in any Elder Scrolls game is always a spell sword or a battle mage or a mage warrior, whatever the fuck you call someone who uses a sword and magic. Cause think about it, at the beginning of both Oblivion and Skyrim, you can't really be just a pure mage cause you run out of magic way too quickly and your spells are super, super fucking weak. And like, yeah, you can just use a sword but i don't know it's just it's just boring just sitting there fucking like clicking and swinging a sword so what do you do you use both at the same time now you have the best of both worlds if an enemy disarms you or your weapon breaks use magic if you can't cast any more spells use your sword like you get the range of a mage and the like melee of a normal warrior maybe it's just the way my brain is wired but I, i've tried playing oblivion and skyrim as like an archer or just a pure mage or a pure warrior and it's just like it's too fucking boring for me like i need to have the ability to be able to use a sword and magic i can't just do one or the other but on a completely different note the dungeons and caves in the overworld in both games are really fucking boring first oblivion gate and your first nord ruin and your cave or your abandoned fort are kind of cool but by the time you get to like maybe 30 hours in you realize that they're all the same and they're really fucking boring although the dwemer ruins in skyrim are awesome i love these so much it's probably just because i'm a nerd and i really like the dwemer lore you can tell that they were all designed by hand and they weren't just random caves made for the sole intent of just go in kill shit get loot and then come out i even love the dumbass helicopters that come up from the floor and then kill you and then send you 30 feet backwards it's just i love I love the maroons. Like, I just wish there was more to do in the overworld in both Oblivion and Skyrim than just walk to this place and kill this monster, or go in this dungeon and kill some stuff and then get some loot and then come out. I feel like there's more you can do with this world than just the same gameplay loop over and over and over again. And in Oblivion, I hate the fact that some dungeons you can go all the way through and there's a quick exit. But then some of them, it's just like you get to the very end of the dungeon and you gotta fucking go all the way back to the same dungeon to get to the exit and you're gonna get lost. It happens to me so much. You're gonna get lost because all the dungeons look the same. Last thing I want to bring up is that there was a fame and infamy system in Oblivion. So people would comment on quests you did. Like if you killed someone, citizens would talk about it. Or if you're walking through the city, people would thank you for closing Oblivion gates. Is it kind of like janky that I do a quest all the way in Leowin and then fast? travel to Bruma and somehow word of mouth has spread to the other end of Cyrodiil in the two hours between or when I'm in the middle of a serious quest with someone and then I click the rumors button and they go oh wow did you hear that someone beat the gray prince they there's a new champion of the arena like is it weird yeah but I still appreciate it because it feels like I'm actually doing things that have an impact on the world instead of just random fucking quests that no one cares about and also you work up the ranks in oblivion and guilds instead of just like showing up and then you're just kind of there for a bit and then all of a sudden you're the super special archmage or the listener or like the leader of the companions I actually i can't remember what the companions is called but you get what i mean people will actually acknowledge you by whatever like rank you're in in that guild so they'll be like oh hello conjurer or hello warlock does each rank of each guild actually feel different in any way i mean no not really it's more like it's more just like something you can check off on a list but it's still cool to feel like what you're doing is progressing and people in the world actually see it meanwhile in fucking skyrim you're the chosen hero with the power of dragon shouts sent by the gods to save tamriel and stop alduin and pretty much immediately become the head of every faction Let you join guess. yet none of the guards Someone give a shit and they still talk down to you and none of the civilians ever go oh hey wow thanks dragonborn for killing that dragon the other day i really appreciate it our town would have been destroyed otherwise you know the ungrateful little f 
You're playing this power fantasy where everyone in the story always praises you for being so special and powerful. It's just a confusing contrast where you're the Archmage and the Listener. Whereas in Oblivion, you're literally just like some dude. The gods did choose you to help Uriel Septim, I guess because they saw it, but they didn't give you any special powers or anything. Like you can't shout in Oblivion or anything like that. You're just a fucking dude. And you aren't even the main character in Oblivion because that's technically Martin. Yet, people in the world still acknowledge the things you do for them and they thank you and you even get a statue of your character built at the end of the story. Which makes me feel like I'm actually part of this world and the things I'm doing impact the people in it instead of just being some random dumbass who can scream really loud. The soundtracks to both games were done by the same person and they're both amazing and fit really well. It's really of the personal taste, but in my opinion, Skyrim has the better soundtrack. Not only is it twice as long, but it encompasses a much larger spectrum of emotions. Whereas in Oblivion, the soundtrack is much more like subdued and relaxed and mellow. Even though it's been years since I first heard a lot of the music in Skyrim, I still get the same feeling as when I first heard these songs. Especially the combat music. Like in Oblivion, you get that one flute song, you know, like that one's pretty good. Now play the Skyrim music. <clears throat> now play the, uh, the Oblivion battle music just for reference. And now play the Skyrim battle music just one more time to be safe. But yeah, Oblivion soundtrack, like I said, is much more relaxed and calm, and it's got that kind of cozy and quaint feel a lot of old games had, and walking around Imperial City at night is like a whole game by itself. But Skyrim, when you see those northern lights and you hear Secunda or the beginning of the White Run music, it's just, there's nothing like it. There really is no competition. Even after all these years, all the music in Skyrim is like ingrained into my subconscious. Although both soundtracks are absolutely hilarious and perfect for memes. If I'll give them that. If we're going off shit post potential, then it's a tie. But the formula for how to make me laugh, just take any cursed image and put this song over it and I'm guaranteed to start losing my fucking mind. And of course, you have the Oblivion NPC song, which is just like, you can put it over any clip and it makes it 10 times funnier. The magic system in Oblivion is better. Normally I'm all for people having their own opinions and acknowledging that everything is up to taste, but no, the magic system in Oblivion is objectively better. If you think otherwise, you are objectively wrong. Here's a brief explanation of this system before I start shitting on the one in Skyrim. So in Oblivion, magic wasn't bound to your hand and instead there was just a button to cast spells. So regardless of what you were holding, you could still cast a spell. Like you could still use spells with a sword and shield or a two-handed weapon. And you can even have a sword and torch and still use spells. Then there's touch-based spells, which are spells that cost less magic but only work up close which make playing a mage so much more fun because you don't become completely helpless once an enemy comes within war crime range then there is another school of magic that got removed in skyrim called mysticism which honestly i thought would be more interesting but like it's whatever mysticism kind of suck and they allocated a lot of the spell effects to either other schools or shouts in skyrim like making soul trap a conjuration spell and the tech life and telekinesis alteration spell plus even after 130 hours of playtime i still have no idea how the fuck this spell works the official description of this spell online reads like those medicine ads where the side effects are worse than what the medicine is supposed to cure hi dagoth Earth here. Don't you hate it when you're just chilling at your preferred establishment and all of a sudden you have to fight a lich that keeps spawning skeletons that have way too much health? Or what about when you get hit with every single possible negative magic effect at once in the middle of combat? What you need is this spell. Spell is a mysticism spell that removes all spell effects from your desired target. Get rid of those pesky bound weapons, summons, and shield spells from enemies in seconds. Magical effects can also be removed from yourself with this spell, such as long-lasting drain or damage spells. That's right, no more magic aids! Call 1-800-GO-FUCK-YOURSELF in the next 15 minutes for a 15% chance to win 15% off the next spell tome you buy. Warning, this spell does not work on and or dispel curses, diseases, scroll effects, potion effects, lesser powers, and lower your constant effect enchantment. This spell points are related to the maximum strength spell that can be removed by the spell spell. The strength of the spell is the magic cost of the spell taking into account the caster level, i.e. not the base magic cost by the list of the spell state. The strength of the spell spell is less than the value that 50 points the spell is the spell of the strength of 250, but not on the strength of 251. Legendary the spell is the strongest spell available, and the spell spell is the strength of the 1,000. Multi effects spells, the spell acts on all the effects simultaneously, i.e., either all removed or none removed. Side effects using the spell may include the function, early onset dementia, corpus disease, scuma addiction, and other non-target effects. Do not use the spell if you are pregnant, nursing, and/or suffer from heart palpitations. What are you waiting for? Start using this spell today. Call the number on screen to receive absolutely nothing.
But yeah, point being, mysticism sucks. Although, for some reason, the same school of magic that has telekinesis also has the two most broken spell effects in the game, reflect damage and spell absorption, which make your character immune to all types of damage and reverse Uno cards all incoming damage back onto the enemy. So they preserved all the other useless skills from this damn-ass, shit-ass school of magic in Skyrim, but got rid of the only actually good spells in the entire school. They also heavily limited conjuration in Skyrim, they got rid of bound armor, and a whole bunch of creatures you could summon, including, but not limited to, Imps, Ghosts, Zombies, Spider Daedra, Scams, Headless Zombies, Clan Fears, Daedros, Liches, Gloom Wraiths, Faded Wraiths, and Zivali. But don't worry everyone, in Skyrim, you can summon the Shade of Arneal Game. So not all is lost. Which ties into another issue I have, ignoring the magic system for a second, Oblivion also had much more enemy diversity than Skyrim. Oblivion had all the things I just mentioned as enemies, but it also had minotaurs, ogres, mountain lions, and my personal favorite, Drew, 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 Drew. <laughs> Anyway, back to the magic system, they didn't just neuter Conjuration, they neutered every school of magic from Oblivion to Skyrim. Oblivion, Restoration was actually a perfectly valid school of magic because it was combat viable against more than just the undead, and Illusion and Alteration had more effects, and Destruction wasn't just three elements. Restoration had absorb spells for every stat in the game, which allows you to damage an enemy in so many different ways. I could absorb someone's intelligence during a fight, essentially making their magic decrease while giving me more magic. You could use it to absorb their one-handed skill, effectively making them weaker and you stronger. Or, you can use Restoration to absorb health, which in Oblivion isn't a spell lock behind having to become a useless shud and also known as a vampire. You could use Restoration to apply buffs to yourself, and it had a cure disease spell too. Illusion had all the same spells as in Skyrim, like Calm, Frenzy, Fleeing, and Invisibility, but it also had a Charm spell that made people like you, a Silence spell which made mages unable to cast spells, and a Night Eye spell to see in the dark, and a Chameleon spell which makes you a little bit invisible, but still allows you to interact with the world. An alteration of the same shield and water breathing spells, but it also had Feather, Burden, Open Lock, and Water Walking. Those last two are pretty obvious in what they do, but I just, I love the fact that there's a spell to open locks because I fucking hate lock picking. And Feather increases your carry weight by a certain number of points, and Burden does the opposite where it adds carry weight. So if you wanted, you could add 300 carry weight to an enemy and basically just paralyze them in place. And there's Destruction, which has a normal fire, lightning, and frost, but, 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 my dear shit ass, it has more than that in Oblivion. It has damage and drain spells for attributes and skills, which means that you can permanently decrease an enemy's health, magicka, or stamina 50 points drain their skills like destruction or illusion which is kind of the same as absorbing it, except you don't like absorb it and you can make them weak to certain kinds of magic or make them weak to poison by a certain percentage and you might say that all of these are op but remember that enemies also had all these spells too like like i said earlier with the spell sword bit they can do all these things right back to you, so you can't just be a pure mage because they silence you, and you can't just be a pure warrior because they could disintegrate your weapon. Which, in my case, doesn't really matter anymore because now my character is fully resistant to magic, so even if I get silenced, it doesn't do anything. However, that's where the enemy's upper hand ends, because you have something that they don't. That's right, this way too long and boring section on the magic system is finally reaching its climax, because everything I just mentioned ultimately culminates into Oblivion's best feature, and probably the best mechanic in any game I've ever played recently. That is spell making. I've been looking for you. Got something I'm supposed to do. That's right, all those ridiculous spell effects I just mentioned in the most boring ass way possible. So long as you have the money and the magic, you can combine any of them to your heart's content, regardless of what school, regardless of what effect, and it is fucking amazing. Because unlike Skyrim, you aren't limited to what spells the game gives you. Take any spell effect and customize it to where you can pick who the spell actually hits, how much damage it does, how big the spell is, how long the spell affects them. It's just, it's amazing. I love the sense of freedom. It it gives you just mess around and make spells catered to your playstyle or just make the dumbest spells possible. If I wanted, I can make a spell that unlocks a door, summons a Dramora Lord for 3 seconds, and does 100 points of fire damage for 10 seconds and kills me. Or I can have a spell that increases the target's speed and athletics by 100 points and demoralizes them so they just piss off into the distance when I cast it. Or just a regular fortify acrobatic spell and do this. I'll just, uh, I'll just, I'll just leave this playing in one of the corners. I'll sh I'm sure she'll come down eventually. You can even make a spell that turns people invisible, cast a stupidly bright light on them, and then frenzies them, so I just have a bunch of angry floating suns attacking people, and the AI has no clue how to respond. Which sounded funnier in my head, because in reality, they all just attacked me, but I cannot express just how fun and broken the spell making system is in Oblivion. It genuinely makes me- oh, hey look, she came down. It makes me feel like a fucking kid again, man. You may ask yourself, but, but like, what's the point of those spells you just made? They seem, like, pointless, and they don't do anything. To which I bring up the irrefutable argument of- because it's funny. <laughs>
If you are a complete stick in the mud though, you can just make a regular boring practical or OP spell. Like you can make an invisibility spell that also heals you. You can get super nerdy and make the most perfectly maximized spell to do damage. And no, I'm not ready or open to admit just how much time I spent thinking about how to perfectly maximize this shit. Spell making also incentivizes learning different kinds of magic. Like when I played Skyrim, I never used Alteration or Illusion because they fucking suck. But in Oblivion, I used all the schools of magic because with spell making, the room for experimentation was so big and there were so many options. And because it's funny. <laughs> I can kind of see why it was removed in Skyrim from a developer point of view because it's really overpowered, but like, so what? That's the player's choice. It isn't like Oblivion forced you to use spell making or make super OP spells. By removing spell making, it's like them saying, no, you can't have fun the way you want. You can only have fun the way that we want you to have fun. You're gonna use our shitty limited spell selection and you're gonna like it. Plus, alchemy and enchanting are already broken in Skyrim, so I don't see what the issue is with having spell making also be broken. Every game is gonna have a way to break it, so why not only give players the option to do it, but do it the way that they want? Plus, spell making allowed magic to be viable in the end game because you weren't limited to what spells you could have. Unlike in Skyrim, where you get master spells and there really isn't anything better than that, and you keep leveling up and all of a sudden that great spell is fucking nothing now. Which sounds really obvious, but it goes such a long way to make magic fun for your entire playthrough, which is literally the entire point of having magic in a game. Genuinely, the only con to the magic system in Oblivion I can think of is the fact that you can't delete spells, and after a while, your menu gets really, really crowded. You can't really discern which spells are which in the menu, and also, all the spells look the same based on what kind they are. Like, here's a basic weakness to magic spell, and here's a spell that does all this shit. But when you take into account spell making and all the extra spell effects that Oblivion has, I can more than over overlook these small cons. God, I can only imagine what it must have been like being a previous fan of the Elder Scrolls and seeing Skyrim get released, because Skyrim was really obviously marketed to people who hadn't played the games before, and obviously it worked, but like, how the fuck did they manage to pitch Skyrim to previous fans of the series? Alright, so we got rid of spell making, which was in every game since Daggerfall, uh, the class system, removed more than 12 spell effects, uh, let's see here, oh yeah, you can't fight underwater, we got rid of the arena, unarmed isn't a skill anymore, but for some reason, reason it's an enchantment you can't use magic while holding something we got rid of the fame and infamy system you can't ride your horse in first person we took out long and short swords you can't use touch spells we got rid of acrobatics and athletics mysticism isn't a school of magic anymore and you can't do backflips but don't worry we have runes and wards and you can conjure arneal gain <laughs> On what planet do you go back in a series and have more features than the most recent installment? That's like the exact opposite of what's supposed to happen with sequels. I just hope that they don't remove even more effects in the next game whenever it comes out, but I, I, I'm i pretty sure they will. Just to market it to a more mainstream audience, like here's what I imagine Bethesda did. Yeah, that's good enough. Even though they've barely given any info on it, it's pretty much a given that they'll expand magic again in Skyrim 2 because shouts replace a lot of spells and shouts aren't coming back because... God, I hate saying this because it sounds so fucking nerdy, but it doesn't make sense from a lore perspective since only a few people are have the ability to shout. Though there are some other unique kinds of magic like sword singing and tonal architecture, but one of those is so powerful that it can split an atom and sunk a continent, and the other one doesn't even exist anymore, so I think it's safe to say that the magic system will be better. Hopefully. Or maybe it won't, and they'll remove even more things. Like the ability to summon Arneal Gain. <laughs> Both main stories are lackluster with really flat characters and plots that don't take nearly enough advantage of the setting or the batshit insane lore that exists in this universe because The Elder Scrolls has the deepest and most unique lore of any fantasy series I've ever seen, but the problem with that is that the average person isn't going to binge watch a bunch of fudge muppet videos to get an understanding of the world they're in. They're just going to want to boot up the game and go, okay cool, I kill dragons, that dragon is a bad guy, I kill him, boom done which ends up massively watering down the lore, and it, and it makes you feel like the Elder Scrolls universe and the actual Elder Scrolls games are two completely separate things. The stories also don't work because narratively they try and make these plots that are made out to be really, really urgent, like, holy fucking shit, you can just have the Mythic Dawn and Alduin right now, but the fact that you can just ignore it entirely for as long as you want and go join a murder cult makes this already bare bones plot lose the one thing that it had kind of going for it, which is a, like a vague sense of urgency, which isn't a problem specific to the Elder Scrolls, 
rules it happens in any rpg like oh hey go save the world but you can do whatever you want but like when your plot is already this like bare bones it really does not help it's also a bit less noticeable in other games because those games actually have decent plots like the witcher 3 Plus, it's obvious that they didn't really intend for players to play through the whole quest just like back to back. I'm sure they tested it countless times, but I don't know if you've ever played Skyrim just strictly for the plot, but it's like, it feels so fucking bad. Just like, it does not work as a story. It makes no fucking sense. The pacing is horrible. Nothing you do feels like it's actually connected. And another reason why I know this is because for every single quest in the game, they added these really detailed journal entries that summarize everything that just happened. So it's obviously intended for you to like do some main quest and then piss off for a bit and then come back and do it, read the summary. Okay, cool. That's where I am. And it also doesn't help because the main plots are really just for like side quests because Bethesda plots are like, okay, cool, go here, talk to this person. Okay, cool, now completely forget about that guy and go here. Okay, now this guy can give you information, but you need to go to a dungeon, but you can't go to the dungeon yet because you're too low level. So now you need money. How do you get money? You do this. It's like a bunch of different steps broken down into your main objective, which is my least favorite thing in video games, just period. Like when they start off with a really basic premise, but they break it down into so many small objectives that you completely lose track of what you're actually supposed to be doing. I don't mind if it's one or two things like, oh, go to this door, but there's a passcode in this other room. Okay, whatever starts to bother me is when i get to the point where it feels like an ai generated story go through this door to turn on the power but the door needs a passcode the passcode is in this other room where the door is locked so you have to climb around the window shimmy around except the footing breaks and you fall all the way down to the basement where you get kidnapped and now you need to escape but to escape you know like it just it's really fucking annoying and i hate when games do that it's such an annoying form of just padding things out unnecessarily with no actual substance and just purely filler because no player is going to remember this let me give you an example from the end game of Skyrim. The goal is to be Alduin, but he's in Sovngarde. How do we get to Sovngarde? We go to Skull Dauphin. How do we get to Skull Dauphin? We gotta capture a dragon. How do we capture a dragon? We learn a shout. How do we learn a shout? Go to Esbern. Okay, cool. I gotta talk to Yara Balgr. Like, do you like? Do you see what's wrong with that? We went from be Alduin to talk to Yara Balgruf. may just say, oh, that's just one example. You're over exaggerating. But let me give you another example from Fallout New Vegas. I, I don't actually have footage of this quest, but just take my word for it. The main goal of the story is to find the guy who shot you. So you go from town to town asking if anyone's seen him and this guy says he knows him, will only tell you if you help him get rid of the ghouls near town. Okay, cool. So we go to the factory, we kill some ghouls, and then someone says, hey, come upstairs. And then you go upstairs and someone says, hey, go talk to Jason. And then you talk to Jason, and then Jason says, go to the basement and get rid of these people. Then you go to the basement and someone says hey get rid of this guy so we can get this thing so you go to talk to that guy and he goes hey go find my dead friend then you go find that guy's dead friend you tell him to leave then you find the thing the other guy wanted and it's actually in another place then you talk to him and then you go back to jason who says come to the basement again and talk to me then you go back to the basement jason says hey talk to this guy that guy says hey get me this thing then you go to that place and the person says i'll give you that thing for 500 bucks so you go looking for 500 bucks you get the money come back to the person give them the money you come back you give it to him and then then and only then do the ghouls leave the factory and you can finally get information about the guy who shot you what the fuck <laughs> The good thing though is like if you've already played the game, you can just go straight to the New Vegas Strip and find Benny, or you can skip this quest entirely by just killing all the ghouls, or you can find the information on the guy's computer, or you can pickpocket off of him, which ironically turns this quest from like a 1 to a 10 because of how many ways they plan for players to skip this quest, but I'm just using it as an example to show really annoying design where it's like, do this thing, but to do that thing, you do 20 other things first. And even though I've only completed Oblivion and Skyrim and I'm currently 10 hours into Fallout New Vegas, I've read and watched plenty of video game essays way too late at night about Fallout 3 and Fallout 4 stories, and I know that they both follow this exact same plot where it's like, okay, you need to find this guy, but to find that guy, you gotta do this and this and this and help this person, and to help them, you gotta do this. It's just like, it doesn't make sense. And the issue is not I don't like complicated or intricate quests. I love them, but I just don't like when it feels like they're needlessly convoluted or just padding for extra time. Anyway, though, I do prefer Oblivion story just a bit more because you stay with the same few characters throughout the whole story, which are Joffrey, Martin, and Boris. I would have loved it if in Skyrim, Rayloff or Hadvar stuck with you throughout the entire game and appeared every now and then to help you, but they never show up unless you do the Civil War quest line, which, who boy, is that its entire own topic I do not care about in the slightest. But in Skyrim's main quest, Quest, it feels like you keep jumping back and forth between people without actually getting to know or bond with any of them. First there's Rayloff or Hadvar, Nyara Balgruf, then the Greybeards, then Delphine, then Esbern, then there's Wood Elf. There's just so many characters you meet but that don't have any extra substance to them and who disappear immediately after they serve their point to the plot. I also didn't outright hate any of the characters in Oblivion's plot, unlike Delphine and Esbern, who are supposed to serve the Dragonborn, but more often than not they may 
make you do the fetch quests for them and order you around for their own gain. Don't let this video distract you from the fact that Delphine saw Alduin resurrect a dragon with her own two eyes, and then looked at you, the dragonborn, dead in the eyes, and said with a straight face, this definitely involves the Thalmor. God, she's so fucking stupid. Like, no, I'm not gonna kill the peaceful dragon who was evil 3,000 years ago, but then pledged to help humanity, is rehabilitating other dragons, and literally got a goddess's approval, and the gods never do anything in this fucking series. Just because you don't like him. If you have such a problem with party snacks when he's the only interesting character in the story besides Septimus, how about you climb the 7,000 steps, Delphine, and take care of it yourself? And the annoying thing is that if you don't kill him, her and Esbern essentially like disown you. Like, you're supposed to serve me! You can go to elderscrollsfandom.com and read it for yourself, bitch. You're not the one calling the shots here. The Blades haven't been needed or relevant for 200 fucking years, but you still want it to be one, only to throw a hissy fit like a small child once the person who you're supposed to serve didn't do something that aligned with your own personal beliefs. Which is another thing, because in Oblivion's plot, it didn't feel like you are being taken advantage of. Like, like, yeah, that quest to get the book and the armor and the stone were kind of annoying. Not to mention the fact that Joffrey lost the fucking Amulet of Kings. Like, you had one job. I left you with the amulet for five minutes while I went to Kavach, and you fucking lost it. Why can I never leave you alone, Joffrey? You even died fighting Daedra and Bruma. But that's still nowhere near as bad as Skyrim. Alright, Dova King, go to this Nord Ruin and get a dragon stone. Oh cool, and I'll kill this dragon for me. Hey, go to this ruin and get a horn. Hey, can you help me infiltrate this party? And by infiltrate, I mean you do everything while I sit back and do nothing. Cool, now can you help me save this old dude? Cool, now can you slowly go through this temple with me and listen to all this boring ass dialogue about a prophecy? Just in case you were under the assumption that we were gonna befriend the spiky black dragon named the World Eater that destroyed a town. I'm supposed to be the Dova King, the symbol of the Nords. Why does he feel like I'm being forced to run errands for everybody? I'm surprised there wasn't a quest for Delphi made you file our taxes and go to the DMV and renew our license plate for how many fucking errands the game makes you run. The villains are both horrible too, like Alduin is just evil to be evil, and main car Cameron kind of had a point to say that the gods are weak compared to Daedra, and the fact that he reconstructed himself with magic is kind of cool, but he only appears, I think, maybe twice, which ruins any sort of fear you have of him. And he even does like the typical villain thing where he just goes off this crazy speech where he's like, oh, I shall eliminate weakness from this world and only strength shall reign. Like, shut up with your McDonald's logo looking Vegeta ass hairline. You don't have to look any deeper into main car Cameron's and ruins Zagon's motivation for the story, and there's no sense of moral ambiguity either. $30 Herica and Shiva for Mortal Kombat, bad, go stop them. And there's Alduin, who also barely shows up in the story, because despite being the harbinger of end times, you don't see any damage Alduin has done throughout the story to civilians or settlements. Through the intro, you only see him two other times, once where you see him resurrecting dragons, where Delphine uses it as an excuse to get you involved in her tinfoil hack conspiracy, the dumbass fight you have at the top of the throat of the world. I mean, shit, dude seems pretty chill to me. He burned down Helgen, but if he didn't, I would have died, so my man can resurrect all the dragons he wants. And they never even explained why he destroyed Helgen too, which seems really fucking important because it set up the entire event of the game. And there is a really cool theory where Alduin knew about the prophecy and then went to Helgen to kill the dragonborn, but inadvertently ended up killing his fate by saving the dragonborn, which I think is really cool, but does the game ever explore that? Fuck no. Then there's the Thalmor, who are actually important to the story, trust me, but they never do anything in gameplay or the story without to make snarky comments and be racist, so why should I, as an outsider to this whole situation, be mad at the Thalmor? If anything, the Imperial are the assholes here because they were gonna execute me for crossing a border when I wasn't even on their stupid list. Back to Alduin though, the only real presence he has on gameplay is you can only see him resurrecting dragons, but I've never seen that happen in any of my playthroughs and you can't interact with him at all. Plus, it should not have been limited to just that. I refuse to believe that Alduin just spent the entirety of the game's campaign resurrecting dragons and never once decided to get a little quirky and destroy another town. What if throughout the story or gameplay you actually went to places he attacked and talked to the survivors and saw the damage he did and the, and the impact he was having on Skyrim and her people. And the people would share their stories with you and encourage you and say things like, Oh, hey, go kill that dragon, Dova King. Maybe at one point in the story, he actually used that ability he has in lore to eat people's time and turn back their ages. But nope. None of the civilians care about all the wind. They're just worried about dragons as a whole and the very important and dangerous civil war that never actually proceeds or resolves unless you get involved. You finish the main quest of Oblivion and everything is destroyed and everybody congratulates you in their own janky way. And you get dragon armor. All the Oblivion gates closed in the world and you get your own statue. But you fight Alduin, who plays out like like every other dragon fight, except he has this one shot that never actually hits you. Then you go through a loading screen and you're just sort of sat there sitting on the burst of dragon's reach like, huh? The game world is the exact same as when you first left Helgen and there's no epilogue, like nobody's gonna thank me or reward me or acknowledge that I just saved the fucking world. To mention that dragons still roam around the world so it seems like you did anything noteworthy throughout the story. <laughs>
Side quests in the Oblivion generally tend to be better than the ones in Skyrim, and everybody always talks about the Dark Brotherhood quest line, which is just like plot twist after plot twist, and quest in the painting, but there are still a few boring ones, like the Potatoes one or the Cum Challenge, but I'd say like 80% of the quests in the game are really good. Personal favorite being like where you reunite the two long lost brothers in Hector, because I love Lovecraft. Last place I expected to see a Shadow over Innsmouth reference was playing an Elder Scrolls game. Even the Fighters Guild, which I didn't really care for, had some really solid quests near the end with goblins. This isn't to say that Skyrim doesn't have its good quests, like as buggy as it is, listen, Windhelm with a serial killer is absolutely amazing. The Dark Brother quest where you, get to, where you get to be Gordon Ramsay. Also, a Knights to Remember. Honestly, a Knights to Remember held my favorite quest in both games because it's just so funny, it manages to keep you entertained the whole time. But the problem is, every quest in Skyrim eventually just defaults to go into Nordic Ruin and kill Draugrs. Even the Bard's College! Like, imagine signing up for Debate Club and then they go, okay, cool. Now go prove yourself in medieval cult quarters combat. Fuck. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. If I'm going to college to be a bard, why do I have to do something completely unrelated to being a bard? What kind of weirdo fantasy world is this where the school system forces you to do something that has nothing to do with what you're studying? I sure am glad that nothing like that happens in the modern college system and you're able to take classes that are strictly tied to your major and not have to do any other general education classes, right? That's really it, though. I know this probably all came off really pessimistically, but I do actually love this series and all the lore surrounding it. I wouldn't have put 131 hours into Oblivion a whole video about it if I didn't enjoy it. And then have to redo that fucking video halfway through because for some reason, half the audio and music just disappeared. I don't know why, I opened the file and it was all just gone. But anyway, you can love something while acknowledging all of its faults and shortcomings, hence why I can say that Skyrim and Oblivion are the two most immersive games I have ever played, while also admitting that they're both the games of all time. The story happened, the characters said things, the music was played, I killed some enemies, and I cast some spells.